Good morning. The time is now uh, 9.32, and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of March 14, 2018 is called to order. First item of the agenda is approval of the agenda in order of priority. Are there any items to add, delete, or change today? Seeing none, a motion to accept. Support. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Motion carries. Introduction of State Board of Education members and guests. Uh, Marilyn, at this time, will you introduce our State Board members, please? I will. Thank you. Um, you've just been listening to Brian Whiston, Chairman of the Board and State Superintendent. And to his left, as we go around the table, Co-President of the Board, Richard Ziley. He resides in Dearborn. The other Co-President of the Board, Cassandra Albrich. She resides in Rochester Hills. Michelle Fecto is the Board's Secretary. She's from Detroit. Nikki Snyder is from Dexter, and she's the board's association delegate, National Association of State Boards of Education. This year's Teacher of the Year, Luke Wilcox, is from Kentwood Public Schools. He's from East Kentwood High School, where he teaches math when he's not hanging out with us and on other adventures. Across the table is Tyler Sawyer. He's from the governor's office. He's the senior strategy advisor for education and career connections. Do I have it right? That's, that's correct. It's because I'm cheating. I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> I did it wrong, too. <laughs> <laughs> and next to him is Eileen Weiser, board member from Ann Arbor, and Lupe Ramos-Montini, board member from Grand Rapids. Board member from Saginaw is Pamela Pugh. Next to me is Tom McMillan. He's the board's treasurer. He's um, absent today, and he resides in Oakland Township. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the state board executive. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're going to introduce new employees. Sheila. Good morning, everyone. I have the esteemed pleasure of introducing Becky Wartala. Becky is joining the Data Research and Information Management Office as our um, department's tech the uh, opportunity to introduce uh, Lisa Gallagher with the Office of uh, uh, Health and Nutrition Services. Hi, um, I work in the area of school climate. I do um, support positive behavior support and MPSS here at the department. It's a cool job because it's uh, cross unit. So school health and school improvement are looking at PBIS and MTSS. What I did before I retired was I worked in the area of Dropout prevention and graduation improvement in uh, the office of special ed. So I'm happy to be back and honored to be here. Did I miss any new employees? Or is that good, everybody? Let's welcome our new employees. <laughs> now we'd like the public to introduce themselves. Marty, please. Hi, I'm Mark Knackley. I'm the Director of Public and Governmental Affairs here at the Department of Education. Bill? Bill Miller, Executive Director, Michigan Association of Intermediate School Districts. Director of Online Professional Learning Mission Virtual. I'm here uh, supporting the literacy work. 
Chancellor, reporter with Merge News. Good morning, Aisha Baldwin, Unicef Field Consultant, Michigan Education Association. Good morning, Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent <coughs> for the Division of Educator Student School Supports. Good morning, Kyle Grant, Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations here at the department. Good morning, Diedrich Martin, Director of Office of Partnership and State, uh, State Reform Officer. Good morning, Sheila Alice, Chief Deputy Superintendent to Brian Wiston. Welcome everybody to the state board meeting. Thank you for being here. If you plan to offer public comment today, please fill out a form and get it to Maryland. Public comment will start approximately one o'clock and you need to be here at that time in order to give your public comment. So the forms are out in the uh, lobby area. You may fill them out and get them to Maryland. Discussion items, first item on the committee, the whole agenda is a presentation on an essential practice for literacy instruction. Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators through its General Education Leadership Network and Early Literacy Task Force has been instrumental in developing essential literacy strategy for Michigan students, beginning with K-3 and pre-K. These educators have brought, have brought through research and key stakeholders together provide all Michigan educators with the essentials for every student, every classroom, every day. They will share their exciting work that they've been doing. Uh, coming to the table is Bill Miller uh, from MAISA, Dr. John Severson, <coughs> Superintendent Muskegon, Susan Townsend, Early Literacy Professional, Professional Learning Grant, Naomi Norman, Assistant Superintendent from Washtenaw, and then in the audience we know we have Dr. Joanne Harper from the GELN Network, Aaron Brown from uh, MAISA, Karen Abram, Principal, and Jody Tuttle, a first grade teacher. So if you could come forward for the presentation, we'd appreciate it. First four uh, up here, and just to recognize how many other partners we have, we, we just saw a few. We're really happy to have uh, Michigan Virtual in the audience. They've been great partners with us on this effort. Also, the Elementary Principals Association. I don't see Paul in the audience, but he's always out to be terrific. I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about our work with early literacy and the state of Michigan and our current state of literacy and what the essentials are and how we're planning to implement them over the next few years to really change the course of, uh, of learning in our state. So I'm going to be talking a little bit off of this document right here that you have. It's called Lagging to Leading. So if you could find that, it just lays out the current situation that we have and also it lays Bill? out our plan. Bill? Yes. Would you mind having a seat because the, the microphones will pick up what you're saying? Oh, there's a seat. Okay. Thank you. All right, Marilyn. Thank you. No, that's fine. I just want people to be able to hear you. Um, So we work with a really uh, significant, significantly important group of researchers. And lagging to leading is one of the pieces where we've identified what the problem is in Michigan around literacy, particularly early literacy in the early, in the early grades. And as you can see from our illustration, uh, we're, we've dropped from 28th in a national ranking on the national uh, test, which is the NAEP, National Assessment of Educational Progress, from 28th in the nation in 2003 to 41st in the nation in 2015. The really disturbing part is our researchers tell us that we're the only state that is not making progress. So the others are continuing to pass us by. 
We realized this in 2014 that we had a significant problem and the intermediate school districts in the state came together and created this group. It's called the General Education Leadership Network. The best minds in the state on curriculum assessment and of course uh, literacy as well. So in instruction, we got our instructional people together. We identified the problem. You can see that Michigan is facing a literacy crisis. On our own state assessment, only 50% of our students in K through 12 are proficient on the state assessment in, lingu in English language arts. You saw a little bit of that publicity earlier. Well, you know, how could this be? What are we doing to, to stop, this, uh, stop this problem? And what we're doing is bringing together the best minds from the ISDs creating a network, we've hooked them up with the best minds from other organizations in the state. And we've got a really strong and robust team, including researchers from our major universities. We've identified what we call the 10 essentials, and you have some, they'll go through that with you. And we've identified coaching model, and we've identified online resources, video resources, very robust. We have all those things in place now. Our system's working. We're in our second year. Uh, we're, we've got quite a bit of participation, but we've only scratched the surface of how many people we need to reach. And you'll get some data on how many people we do need to reach, and you'll see our plan, uh, phase one through uh, phase four, on the third page of this document. So we have, we have a lot of work to do, but I think we've come a long way already. And we've done so with the Department of Education as a great partner. They, the people here have been terrific. Um, we certainly need more resources. There's no question about that. But we've got a lot of in-kind resources. Most of this has been done through our association and work with the other education groups and associations. We've had very little state support for this. And we're going to work do it anyway, because we have to. So just. We'll be uh, following up with a little bit of an ask from you at the end about how you can support us and help us. Uh, but right now, I'm going to turn the program over to who's first, Susan? It's still you, but we can. Oh, that's still me. Yeah, that's still okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Just to say. But I can talk be, to him. No, before <laughs> any, of this other, any of these other things happen, we already established the essentials. The governors had a work group. We had a third grade retention bill two years ago. We got some grant funding uh, for coaching, and there's also the Governor's Literacy Commission. So people all around the state are recognizing this as a problem. But these are reports, committees, and commissions. <coughs> what we're going to talk about is the real work that's being done. And the, we've weaseled our way into all of these committees and commissions with our people <laughs> because we feel so strongly about this that we need representation on all these groups. Uh, in order to move our work forward. So uh, just so that you know, we're not the only group that recognizes this as a huge problem and that wants to do something about it. And we much value working with the governor and uh, the Literacy Commission you know, to secure the resources that we need to move this agenda forward. So. Joanne? You, can I sit right here? Good morning. <laughs> I want to start out by saying two words, and that is something's different. And the something different is what I'm, we're going to talk about, about the new levels of collaboration that we have um, undertaken. <clears throat> but the first slide is about our general education leadership network. And um, it is a network of the assistant superintendents and directors of instruction across the state at ISDs. We always existed in an association, but about three years ago, we recalibrated and looked at forming a new vision and really focusing on leadership and direction. We wanted to identify expertise across the state and build relationships very tightly so that we could eliminate redundancies and um, make a difference more proactively. We wanted to not be reacting all the time. We wanted to get out in front of work. So as Bill said, we've really worked hard to work with the governor's office, the Literacy Commission, our partners, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. And we are working to be influential and in working along with you in raising forward the top 10 and 10 goals and aligning our work with that and making sure that what we do makes a difference in classrooms for children across our state. 
So this slide represents a really important piece. And I've been in education over 30 years in Michigan at ISDs for 20 years. We've never had this level of partnership that is spoken to in this slide. So you'll see that we have the Michigan Department of Ed and Michigan Department of Ed initiatives involved at the table of our literacy task force. We also have professional associations at the bottom of the image. So we have McCall and MEMSPA and MACE and Michigan Virtual, our partners, um, here in the back of the room who are helping create uh, top-notch resources that are high quality along with our researchers. And then on the right are the professional associations and local district partners that are working along with us. And then on the left are researchers. And this is the first time also in, in my experience that we've worked so tightly as a state with researchers who help us identify where we should be headed with literacy in Michigan. Dr. Nell Duke is one of our lead researchers, and she's recognized internationally. She's actually on the National Commission for um, Literacy in the, in the country, and she travels around. We have a hard time getting her at the table, but she comes to every single meeting that we have, and there's a real commitment here. This isn't come sometimes and then not others. These people roll up their sleeves and help us and you have the evidence here. So that's what I wanted to say in the quote from Margaret Mead on the right. Sometimes you hear that thrown around and you know you think yada yada, but in this case, this small group of people do roll up their sleeves to me every month and the efforts are what is gonna be shared this morning. So thank you for listening to us. And as Joanne said, we have been so fortunate not only to have a commitment from our leaders across the state, but also we've had the collaborative initiative from all of our partners with lead researchers at the table. And you can see from this slide, we've got Dr. Christy Cooperstein from Michigan State University and Dr. Melissa Usiak from Michigan State who helped us develop and were the key researchers with the school-wide level essentials that we're going to look at in a minute. We've also had Dr. Susan Lallier from Northern Illinois University who helped us with our, who continuously helps us with our coaching and helped us write the coaching essentials as well. We have Dr. Tanya Wright and um, Christy Cooper Stein working with us from Michigan State and they were um, key people of course with the pre-K and the K-3 essentials and they have been supporting all of the other work that we've created with the other essentials and all of the researchers. Um, Anne-Marie Palancar has helped us. Um, she was the researcher, the key researcher between the, between the uh, for the fourth and fifth grade essentials. And so we've been extremely lucky to have their expertise at the table and we think this is another collective initiative that we're doing and we're working together with our partners statewide and they're at the table. They know, they're internationally, now works international. So we feel very fortunate and I feel very blessed because I get to talk to them all the time and continue my learning around this work, around literacy for our kids. Um, you have in front of you the book of the latest and greatest essential practices and I think it's important to note that these were developed with a certain threshold of research that we um, wanted to ensure, and that was that these have been tried practices. It's peer-reviewed research that they're based upon, and they're also um, the newest and latest research. And you can see we have in this booklet the pre-K, the K-3, 4, 5, the school-wide and center-wide essentials, which helps buildings, and then the coaching essentials, which helps our coaches utilize tools to be able to go in and support the teachers in their instructional practices. The pre-K and K-3 and the 4-5, of course, are for the classroom as well. Um, it's important to note that we have currently our researchers working on the birth to three. Dr. Claire Velotten is helping us with um, the birth to three document that is going to be um, ready for its first draft review this spring. And then we also have the 612 essentials being created. So when these are complete, we will have a birth through 12th grade set of essentials that are the newest, latest, and greatest research. And we will continuously review these to update them. So it's the current practices that all teachers and, and, and leaders should be focusing around with every child, every classroom, every day and it's all in one package. So we're very excited about these documents um, and see the, the, the foundational practices 
and we believe through our theory of action, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that if we really start focusing and implementing these practices with every child, we will see a difference in student achievement. These are, as I said, they're research-based, and it's like medicine. They're, they're, they're our practice guides. It's the minimum standard of care for our kids. Just like if you, as Nell Duke always says, if you have a child that's a diabetic, you, don't, you want the best care, and there are certain criteria you need to have to ensure your health in diabetes. Just like in literacy, there are certain criteria that all kids should have across the state. And when she ties those two together, it really hits home because the reality is we don't push that health, that care away. We embrace it. As you can see from this slide, and you also have a bigger handout in front of you, um, it really talks about the building of capacity that's needed across the state. We have a plan, and this plan really encompasses um, all areas. We, we want to work, and we believe we know that so far we've, we're working with the literacy leaders. We've had some rollouts around the essentials for them. We have a long way to go because we want to get to where they really are able to work with each other and develop that statewide network centered around the school-wide and center-wide essentials, and also their building practices, whatever level they're in, whether it's pre-K, K-3, 4, 5, or 6, 12. We also know that um, we have the coaches group, and that through the coaches group, we've developed networks, and we're going to, I'm not going to take this away from you. The chart kind of talks about what we've done. We've focused around the essentials, and um, we've also created modules to go along with this work through a partnership with EduPath and Michigan Virtual, which we're going to talk more about as well. We have the teachers working with coaches um, on these instructional practices to, to help them understand and implement um, these practices more efficiently and effectively for all students. And we've also been working with our systems leaders across the state, giving several presentations centered around these essential practices and how to move them forward. We know that we have 56 ISD and regional school service agencies. We also know we have approximately 444, 440 district leaders across our state. We have 1,825 approximately building leaders. We have about 700 ISD slash district coaches. We know to really do this work and move it forward, we could use about 2,000, one for every building. There's 22,000 teachers approximately in our state. We also have the early childhood group, 500 plus pre-K GSRP teachers, and that's just the GRCRP population of preschools, not the private preschools, et cetera. So we know as we're building this capacity, these numbers show how much further we have to go to develop the capacity. And you're going to hear how we envision that both in a, in a, with a blended learning process. So 22,000 teachers. That's a lot of people. That's teachers who have kindergarten through third grade, that number. Um, that's a lot of people to reach. These practices are instructional practices, so it's how you teach. It works with different curriculum, it works with different programs, it's not limited, so it's about our practice. If we want to touch that many teachers in their practice, we have to have more than just a nice document like this. <laughs> this outlines it, but how do we help bring it alive? Susan talked a bit about how building out coaches, coaching networks, and support, but in addition to that, we partnered, not just the Early Literacy Task Force, but we worked very intentionally with additional partners um, in Michigan Virtual, as well as um, MEMSPA. MEMSPA, the Michigan Elementary and Middle School Principals Association, um, EDUPASS is another group, uh, to create online modules that teachers could use that help bring these a bit more alive. <laughs> What's really magical about these uh, modules and they are online and available for teachers to do whenever they have the time to do them, is that we actually went into Michigan classrooms and videotaped 
these practices in action in a typical Michigan classroom. So they can actually see practices in action to get ideas and examples of what it should look like or could look like in their schools. And those same videos and these modules, in addition to being able to be used by individual teachers, coaches can use them to do extended activities or work with groups of teachers to support them. It's one of the most powerful ways we can ensure that we're reaching every corner of the state. Um, as someone who grew up in the Upper Peninsula, being able to reach a teacher who is way far away from maybe an ISD or very rural, um, this is at least a resource that they can access when they have time to work on that. Um, it's also um, a way to help us all in our very distributed state um, work from the same set of frame, same really high quality practices, making them visible. Um, let's go to the next slide. So <laughs> these are available. We wanted to have sort of a one-stop place you can go if you want to access any of the resources related to instructional practice, related to the, all of the different essentials and the different work and guides uh, that people can access. And the website is literacyessentials.org. We've had over 200 uh, visits to this site since it launched earlier this year. We also, with the <laughs> modules, we, um, on the last slide we had mentioned that there were 1,200 active users, people actually in the modules using them. We just looked again this week and it's up to 2,500. Our goal would be to have every single teacher in Michigan know and understand and utilize these practices uh, so we have a minimum standard of care and that we are supporting them and doing that really well. Um, I have to do one other call out one more time. We could not do this website or those modules without the support of Michigan Virtual and everything that they're putting into it above and beyond even our grant funding. Mm -hmm. So it's my honor to quickly name what has happened in the past year and a half. First, to support the 118 ISD early literacy coaches partially funded through the grant but now to name that that network has expanded to include 600 additional district coaches from around the state thanks to the leadership and partnership with Michigan Department of Education. So in the past year and a half, we have three prongs of our professional learning network, and it truly is a network. We know that for quality professional learning to happen, thinking about adult <coughs> learning, we need networks of support where people are leading from within and emerging needs and priorities based on the growth of that network. So the three uh, main pieces are that we gather face-to-face -face periodically to learn from the premier li literacy researchers around the world. Um, and they come here to Michigan, they speak into our needs, they give us the literacy research that we need to make an, a, a significant difference in, um, in classrooms for all of our kids. Um, uh, as well as that, face-to-face, -face, we have a robust online learning community supported by Michigan Virtu Virtual as well, not just the modules, but a place where the coaches are able to go and get that just-in-time support from each other. So we have virtual meetings that happen regularly with different work groups who have emerged, a professional learning work group to help us say, how could these modules be best used? Um, a family engagement work group, a uh, work group around classroom libraries, because that's one of our main goals from our ISDs around the state. Um, so we're being very nimble and responsive to the needs of the early literacy coaches as they emerge. And then the third piece I just want to name really quickly, um, it was an honor to work with Dr. Susan Lallier, probably one of the experts on literacy coaching in the world, to create an intensive coaching project where 12 early literacy coaches from around the state come partner with an elementary school. We live in that school for four days, benefiting them to get some additional professional learning. But what happens is coaches work in partnership, coaching right next to each other, giving each other feedback in real time. And the feedback from that kind of experience is that that's really transforming the coach's ability to impact practice. And we've had um, three of those intensive projects already at three different elementary schools. We have two more on the horizon and more next year. What's cool is that it's not just Dr. Susan Lally who's created that, but now we're emerging coach leaders from Wayne Risa, from Saginaw, from Calhoun, and from Charlevoix who are going to be leading this work for our state and more coming into that leadership as we move forward. So thanks for the honor to share what they're doing. Yeah, so, and also just to name <laughs> that not only literacy coaching, but we have a vision to create that kind of network for all groups of educators. That slide that named, we have several um, school leaders, we have systems leaders, and as we move forward, 
Um, we know that we've already started that with the principals. We had two huge sessions last summer so they could start to get some of this learning from the researchers around the school-wide essentials. Um, but as we move forward into this next summer, we're imagining that they're going to create a robust network as well from some face-to-face -face learning and then online support from, Mich um, from MEMSPA, Michigan Elementary and Middle School Association. So this, this vision of a network that's both face-to-face, -face, online, and grassroots is going to be expanded to our early childhood um, education specialists and our principals and then beyond as is needed. So what we're talking about is really a transformation. We've created the sense of urgency um, we're utilizing a roadmap, a literacy theory of action roadmap. And if you look at some of the things that have already been discussed, we've already started to sprinkle, even though it's linear, a lot of these things are taking place. But I want to really draw your attention to that the urgency is we know where we stand and we know where we need to be. And we talked a lot about equity today. We talked about different parts of our state. We talked about our systems. And all of this really stems about really good collaboration when everybody gets together on the same page. I think of this as our roadmap, and these, this document is our playbook. You know, with some of the top researchers tell an ISD superintendent, I've collected these things and I know we can be better, and we can demonstrate that by doing these things, we believe these outcomes will happen. So we did talk a little bit about aligning policies and resources we're still working on those pieces, right? Developing regional leaders. You've heard that starting to be sprinkled along. Embedding these practices. I will tell you this week alone, at our ISD, 60 teachers came in after school from four to seven o'clock, working with these coaches, unpacking the essentials, sitting with like members, talking about how to use these essentials in their classroom. This is where the rubber hits the road. We could talk a lot about graphics and things, but when you see it as an ISD superintendent, you're very excited because you see that transformation. But I'm not talking about just our ISD. We're thinking about how do we overlap? How do I work with my neighbors, Nuego, Allegan, Kent, Ottawa, Macomb? This is about us as a whole state. It's not about a specific group. So when you hear about the modules being utilized, we're talking about actual deliverables that everybody can use. So this is the playbook that gets us more focused about how we work together and how we get this ingrained all the way through the system. You know, principals are a big key of this too. We have to build every principal so they can be those instructional leaders. So many of you who have been in the system know that that's a big part of that. If we could transform them culturally, we can have this awesome change. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide, which is commitments. And one of my roles as the uh, ISD instructional chair, um, we had a summit November 9th, 2017. We brought every ISD leader to that summit and we basically locked the doors and said, we're not gonna to leave till we have some strong commitments. And at the end of the day, um, all of the ISDs settled on these commitments. Number one being all in, working with their board to pass a board resolution. Communication of the essentials, that's not just giving a teacher these essentials, but how we're gonna impact them, how we're gonna coach, how we're gonna use the modules, how we're gonna cross lines, how we're gonna work with each other. Literacy topics on all agendas, not just putting it on the agenda, but best practices. What would Nell Duke tell us to do if we put it on the agenda? Are we gonna show examples of MSTEP? Are we gonna have those tough conversations? Support politically and with a match. So ISDs, we know we're involved politically, but we have to have a purpose to be involved politically. And so this is our goal, to use that literacy to drive a lot of our conversations. We know a lot of ISDs are already putting skin in the game, which we wanted to do, because we believe in this work. And the last one I'm gonna talk about briefly is support for expansions of classroom libraries. I think we could do a better job as a state providing more equity to all classrooms. There's a lot of classrooms in our states that do not have classroom libraries. So I'm gonna give you an example. Moon Elementary and Muskegon Public Schools, outside funders donated money to give every classroom, kindergarten through sixth grade, classroom libraries. And we were on the ground working with them very closely. And I think our role as ISDs is setting the leadership, but also setting the conditions, building those relationships. And working with them, we ingrained a lot of the essentials as well. And Moon Elementary had double-digit gains in literacy. 
So I look at our ISDs being all in, how we play that role, how we create the conditions, and that we don't just look at our little area of the state, we look at the whole state. These are all of our kids. So I think the urgency has been created. I think Dr. Miller talked about that extremely well. But these commitments and what we're gonna do with each one of those commitments shows that all the ISDs are in. It's my honor right now to welcome some voices from actual classrooms and schools. So it's our joy to hear now from Karen Abraham from Whitehall, Michigan, and Jody Tuttle from Orchard View in Muskegon, Michigan. Hi, Hi I'm Karen Abraham. I'm currently principal of Shoreline Elementary in Whitehall District Schools. I'm honored and excited to be here today to share my experience with the 10 Essentials in two different elementary buildings in two different districts in Muskegon County and in schools with over 70% free and reduced lunch. Today I'd like to make four key points around the 10 Essentials. I want to tell you about the changes I've seen in teachers, um, results in data from the past year, um, information on the Tensive Literacy Coaching Institute we hosted, and my principal's perspective. The biggest impact on teachers that I've seen is the excitement when they first read the 10 essentials. Yes is almost universally heard out of their mouths. Uh, the 10 essentials re-energizes teachers and increases teachers' efficacy. It brings a sense of purpose to their work and to their literacy instruction, which becomes intentional. They make sure their instruction includes the 10 practices every day. When I received the invitation to share with you today, I asked my teachers what they would like you to hear, and they gave me the following items. The 10 essentials influenced and changed instructional practice at Lincoln Park Elementary by inspiring the staff to implement Essential 5. Staff did this through implementing Words Their Way word study in first through fifth grade. Staff were inspired to implement Essential 7 and began over vocabulary study in kindergarten through fifth grade. And the 10 essentials had the biggest impact on first grade instruction. One of my first grade teachers worked with a county literacy coach on essentials 2, 7, and 10. The teacher shared with her peers. And out of that coaching came direct vocabulary instruction that was integrated across the curriculum in all the first grade classrooms, increased family engagement with book swaps and family read alouds, and our vocabulary scores on Lexia Rapid tests skyrocketed. Implementing the 10 essentials has resulted in academic growth at both of my schools. K-5 academic language scores are above 80% proficient compared to 50% proficient or lower prior to implementing the 10 essentials a year and a half ago. And our school-wide reading proficiency has grown from 44% proficient as a school to 71 proficient in reading. In addition to our work, on the 10 essentials, Lincoln Park was asked to host the Intensive Literacy Coaching Institute last October. This was a week-long institute with Aaron Brown, Dr. Susan Lallier, and Dr. Nell Duke. Coaches from multiple ISDs participated in the institute. This was the first time in my career <coughs> I have ever experienced collaboration across ISDs. Six of my classroom teachers participated and benefited from learning with and alongside the ISD coaches. Coaches modeled small group literacy instruction in the classroom and spent time in deep conversation with the teachers. The entire staff benefited from the interactive staff meeting with Dr. Nell Duke and hosting an embedded professional development program at their school. Lastly, I'd like to share my principal's perspective on the impact on teaching and learning. The 10 essentials have increased and improved small group reading instruction, increased parent involvement with first Friday family read alouds, Increase the focus on vocabulary instruction. Increase collaboration at the school level, at the county level, and at the state level. The 10 essentials gives teachers a common language to use across the state. It has resulted in excellent professional development videos that were created for each bullet point under each essential. These have been great tools for professional development and provide teachers and administrators of a visual of what great literacy looks like looks like and sounds like in the classroom. As a principal <laughs> with a strong background in literacy, I want you to know that the 10 essential practices have energized my work and I've seen great growth in the students and in the efficacy of my teachers at both elementary buildings. We've only just begun the work with the 10 essential practices 
and need time to grow this around the state. However, if any, every teacher includes the 10 essential practices every day, there will not be a third grade reading problem in the state of Michigan. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to share with you today. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Jody Tuttle, and I'm a first grade teacher at Orchard View Early Elementary in Muskegon County. And first off, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be here speaking to this group. And I'd like to personally thank all of those in this room for the support in creating the essential practices in early and elementary literacy. This document, although it appears brief, has great depth of content. It has given me a strong framework with which I can deliver instruction using any research-based program. This document has become a beacon for me and many others in public education. I've taught in Michigan public schools for 25 years, and I can honestly say teaching is more than a job for me. It is my passion, my hobby, my calling. Many people would probably think after 25 years I should have the experience enough to do the job well, but doing the job well has never been good enough for me. <coughs> I want to teach to my highest ability to all of my students day in and day out. The literacy essentials have not only helped steer my instruction, they have also forced me to reflect on and increase the rigor with which I teach. As a grade level chairperson in a building with eight first grade classrooms, I've also had the privilege to share my excitement and passion with my coworkers. Much of the new training and professional development we are involved with stems from the work of the essentials as you've been hearing about. Last year, I had the privilege of having a literacy coach with whom I worked closely throughout the school year, and we continue to meet on our own time to this day to reflect and discuss data and best practices. That includes Saturday morning meetings, evening meetings. Um, we, we, just, we spend as much time as we can together because we still feel we have so much learning to do. During the coaching process over the course of the last school year, I chose three personal goals based on the essentials where I knew I could be doing something more in depth for my students. My coach not only encouraged, supported, researched, co-taught, gave feedback, and learned alongside me, she cheered me on the whole while. And again, evening, even meeting and doing um, Skype in evenings and weekends so that we could continue our conversations. My tier one instruction became more effective in both reading and writing. My year-end data last year reflected increases from previous years, and my current classroom data has students on target to achieve even higher results this year. I can't wait to see what June brings. This, um, the support I received from last year's coaching project also helped me feel confident in volunteering to participate in a research project with Dr. Laura Tortorelli um, through Michigan State University. This process encourages collaboration with teachers across districts, across counties, and across the state of Michigan. It is amazing that we are all speaking the same language in regard to literacy, the essentials, and instruction. The literacy essentials in the coaching process have made me aware that every day there is something more I can learn which improves my instruction through constant collaboration with my coworkers. This is a little wildfire within them as well. And I hope that through the state's continued support, you can fuel this wide wildfire through every county in Michigan so that all teachers can have the opportunity to work with a coach so they can sort in new heights and take those around them along as well. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here this morning and allowing me to speak. Thank you. I get some good closing, so. You might ask yourself, well, why haven't we done this before? <laughs> you know, what's the deal? Well, I always hear from the state board, well, local control state. So, um, mm. you know, people can sort of do what they want. We can't mandate this practice. Really, we should, honestly. <laughs> this should be just required that teachers go through this training as, as pre-service teachers as well. So we're trying to reach down to the colleges and universities to say, why aren't you teaching your researchers tell us this. How come this isn't being taught to every teacher in the pre-service program, as well as moving the, these uh, very excellent teachers that we have to a new level of, of achievement for students? We have a really idiosyncratic way of dealing with reading. People each have their own. There may be 10 essentials, but in our school, we do three. Well, you can't do three. You have to do all 10. That's what the researchers are saying. Well, we do phonics. That's our main focus in this school. Well, that's one thing out of 10 that you really need to do. And so when you start learning about these essentials, you realize there's a lot of things that we're doing that don't work at all. I'll give you, give you a great example. Sustained silent reading. The research says it does nothing. Drop everything and read. Not a good strategy. Using foster grandparents to come in and read to your kids. Nope. 
Those don't work, but we spend a ton of time on strategies that don't work. So this really focuses people on, here's the things that actually work, and you need to practice them in your classroom every day. And obviously you can tell we've got the, uh, the playbook, as John said, we've got the talented leaders that are here today. We've got prepared coaches, we don't have enough. We need more. We've got strong partnerships, and I think that's been demonstrated today. And we've got a great uh, research arm, which is Hanover, that's going to look at both the quality of our training, but also the results. You heard one anecdote, our kids have done better here. Moon Elementary raised their scores. But we're going we're gonna to make sure that every place this is implemented, we have a great um, body of knowledge about how it's working and what difference it's making. So again, we're into it a year and a half. We're going to stick to this. If you look at our plan, we're going, we've got a few things left to do in 2018, but then we're on our way to trying to scaling this up from 2018 to 2021, and we think we can get there in three years. And I think in three years, you're going to see a tremendous difference in our national scores for fourth grade reading. We're not going to be 41st or 50th. We'll be at least back to where we were <laughs> even a better. few years ago. And even better. So the top 10 is our shot. We're going for it. Look, you'll see what the actual 10 essentials are by grade level in the handout. So questions. Thank you. Eileen, please. I am sorely tempted to lead the board in a standing ovation. Thank you, folks, because this is you've been, <laughs> you've been waiting to hear something like this for a long time, and Bill keeps on providing teasers of it's coming, it's coming, and we have to change. So uh, for everybody at this board and looking in the audience at the smiles, for your anecdotes, and for the promise this holds to change children's lives, I cannot thank you enough. Luke, please. So I'd like to just highlight a couple of thoughts that I have from the presentation um, around the idea of coaching and the, and the idea of literacy coaches. My, my wife is a third grade teacher, and so she lives this every day, and I see her live this for the last 15 years. And uh, her district has a, a, a literacy coach, uh, a, a, a literacy coach, and uh, <laughs> And she, and she wants to grow, and, and she's, she's tremendous when it comes to literacy, but she's always looking for that improvement, and she's, she's actually found it difficult to access the coaches because, of the, because there's, there's not enough coaches to go around. And so I, I think your idea of, uh, encourage, uh, of, of getting more coaches available, I think, is, is, a, is a tremendous idea, and we see the value of the coaching right here at this table. And the research says that there's a lot of things that we do in education for professional development that doesn't work. But one of the things that we do do that works is coaching. Because it's like experiential, job-embedded, professional learning. So I, I, I urge us to think uh, moving forward how we can have more of those coaches. And then the add-on to that is, if we're, if we're going to continue to add these coaches, that we need to make sure that the coaches are high quality. Mm -hmm. And you certainly have been doing a lot of thinking about growing your coaches. because. You know, two years ago, we had zero coaches, and all of a sudden, we're trying to pull 2,000 people uh, out of our workforce to say, you're going to be literacy coaches. Well, we probably don't have 2,000 highly qualified literacy coaches. So we have to think about how, how can we train them so that they can be effective. But certainly, I think the benefit is there, and I think that's a high leverage strategy for uh, implementing these, these essentials that you have. <coughs> Right. Thank you very much. For, uh, oh, I'm sorry, more? Sorry, yeah, uh, uh, Cassandra, then Nikki. Thank sorry, you. thank you for uh, coming today. I just had a really quick question. So I know that the audience for this really are the teachers and the educators, but is this type of information available to parents as well so that they know ex they know what to expect? Well, as a matter children? of fact, uh, the Department of Education has just let out an RFP for the birth through three essentials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we do intend <coughs> to apply for that, and we intend to make, move this work down directly uh, <coughs> accessible to parents okay. and, and not just that level but one of the essentials is how you engage parents already in these other areas but we're going to try to start earlier with that and the vi video modules unfortunately we don't have time to show you one of these video modules are just incredibly powerful for, for parents to use at home mm -hmm. and we'll have those available and that's going to be a real a great resource um, for getting ready for school and uh, most people have access to online learning at this point, so I think that's going to be a, a real benefit.
Um, and I also want to um, thank you for all your work. Um, this is uh, critical to our state. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Detroit in particular. I'm thinking about the retention bill it's going to hit. And I'm like thinking of the numbers that are really low in the city. Um, and, you know, I, I'm wondering if there's prioritization for um, districts like Detroit uh, where the numbers and where the impact of the retention bill is going to be really uh, hit hard. Um, and uh, with that also, I mean, I know in Detroit they've been taking coaches and putting them in the classroom because there's been a, such a, um, a need to get teachers there in, in, in their classrooms. Um, and so I, I'm wondering, is there a, a specific strategy for districts um, that have a really high need um, and to have partners within those districts? I see Wayne State wasn't on the list of partners and that they are a funnel for a lot of the Detroit schools. Um, and also um, targeting kids that might have, there might be more learning disabilities, they might have a higher concentration in their schools of children with disabilities, and if, and um, uh, reading disabilities, dyslexia, whatever it is. Uh, so is there a strategy to focus on these schools that have these particular problems and give them extra support? Please. Yeah. Um, okay, this is a really, really big issue, and I'm glad you brought it up because I think it's also an area that um, we need to put a lot more time and energy in. But a few things. First of all, the research that we used um, in developing these, many of these uh, peer reviewed research articles actually were studied and compiled in districts like Detroit. So I want to start by saying the practices we know work with all kids. Um, the second point about this work, there is a huge challenge in our schools, and we have some in our county too, um, meeting the needs of every kid when so many kids have so many needs. You can't intervene your way out of that work. We have to be talking about what's happening at the core classroom level and how we really support those classroom teachers to be as effective as possible in their everyday literacy practices. So I, my first answer to you would be we have to um, do everything we can to support our districts like Detroit and others um, really enhance and support those teachers with their core instructional practices. And I know Diedrich's in the room because we've been in conversations, <laughs> other conversations, and his work working with some of our districts that are struggling the most. Um, it's really about how do we ensure that those teachers have all of those supports. Um, I did meet with some of the leaders um, in some of our more struggling districts, and they said to me that one of their big challenges is they have very high teacher turnover. So all the strategies that could help them hire and retain uh, great teachers are the sort of policy supports and funding supports that they would need. So I, I would put that back on all of us to try and figure out how to support that. What else? And just to add to what Naomi said and to answer and follow up on your question, these are practices that we're really reaching out through our coaches to support the classroom teacher. Um, and we are continuously reaching out to ensure partnerships so when we started the task force, I think we started with maybe 15 people, and we're now up to above 50 because we're continuously trying to make those connections with people because we want everyone at the table, and we want to be very intentional in reaching out to everybody. So that's a continuous um, process that we work through to get everybody at the table as I well. I wanted to share too in Muskegon, and, and Muskegon is not Muskegon, Muskegon Heights in our county. Um, we're working with uh, Ottawa. Ottawa crosses over um, Kent. You know, we've been very purposeful in those kind of conversations. I think that's where we're talking about with those ISD commitments, how do we maybe cross some of these lines to help each other? So I could tell you right now with the Reading Now Network, there are a lot of people going in doing instructional rounds, going to different schools, 
and looking at these pra uh, best practices, and they're going all over Region 3 and 7 right now. So those things are taking place, but I think to solve Detroit, it's going to be bigger than just Wayne County doing that. It's going to take all of us mm -hmm. to be a part of that table. The other part is there's a lot of adverse childhood experiences with trauma, mm -hmm. and we know that mental health is a big piece. So I know in our region, we're talking more about mental health and that support at the same time we're working on those essentials. We need those kids to have breakfast every day. We know all those things have to be in place for a child to be successful. Hey, Nikki, and then Dr. Z, please. Um, thank you for all this work. I know that it is definitely, I'm sure, taken quite a bit of time and effort. Um, I'd like to ask some questions of the teachers. Will you guys come back up? <laughs> Didn't want to see you go away. Okay. You mentioned something about they're not eventually, I mean, the goal, right, is to not have a third grade reading problem. If all teachers had access to the 10 essentials, if all kids have access to the 10 essentials. So you, when you guys went through your teacher prep um, courses or programs, did you have access to a course that unpacked these essentials? I've been in education almost three decades, so no, okay. <laughs> there wasn't um, when I started. Um, and even I've taught um, adjunct classes for Grand Valley in uh, reading, and it wasn't available. Um, so so in, this is new. new. In terms of, of teacher prep standards, we have power over that. So I think we could probably make a difference in that in the future. I'm assuming that teachers would want to have I some wish, sort of base I level. I wish I could have had yeah, something like this, because, you know, I, I think that the whole portion of discussing literacy coaching is huge. That's, I mean, not, not the same thing, but that's technically what I do with the nursing in terms of being a, a lactation consultant. It's a specialty. But, but yet nurses and, and lactation consultants talk all the time about how great it would be if there were more of a base level understanding and support going through the programs before you get into the field. Right, because then maybe you have the opportunity to impact some some you know struggling readers, but not readers that really need that additional coaching or um, expertise. And so, how do you do that if you don't have that base level knowledge? So maybe even something like this. I mean, if we really walk it back to our third grade reading problem, could have been something we we could impact. So, is that something that you guys would appreciate from the State Board of Education in terms of our ability to impact the prep standards? Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Most definitely. Yeah, I think we could do that. I think we could do that. It wouldn't be right. I'm sorry, I'm part of the group, but I don't think it would be right to not honor the fact that the Michigan Department of Ed Office of Professional Preparation is on the literacy task force, and we have the leaders, representative leaders from that yes. group who have already worked to align the standards to the essentials. They've been working with the researchers on their team, so I don't right. want to go away from here thinking that they're not a That's part of this that is work. Happening. Sure, yes. Yes. we could definitely yes. work together. I think That's what I'm, I guess yes. the point, because I'm noticing just that first step of effective literacy coaches have, you know, it's a be above and beyond, but still that teachers in general haven't had access to that high quality um, prep standards to begin with, right. yes. which is something we could impact. Um, the other thing I heard you say, Bill, was talking about how we focus so much on phonics. I don't think we focus enough on phonics. When you said SSR um, has not worked, I think if, and I could be corrected if I'm wrong, okay. but I think SSR, again, walking back, was actually part of a whole language strategy. So if you think about kids that don't have skills and really have issues and are struggling greatly and need that extra coaching, and you ask them to sit down and here, go read this book, they just kind of sit there and act like they're reading. And if you have a child that comes home acting like they're reading day after day after day, crying and screaming and really struggling, that's when you start to have a heart for really digging into the facts of why we are where we are at. So for me, I would like to make sure that, you know, I, I would love to take this home and really dig into it and understand the 10 essentials, get teachers the 10 essentials in their prep standards before they even become a teacher, and then have enough access to the, ex the, the actual coaching that we need. Because you're right, we shouldn't have a th third grade reading problem. And I think we can get there. I think so it thank would, you. in response, one additional response, um, when the new prep standards come to this table, in addition to looking for the essentials in them, the other is we have to have more credits in the teacher preparation focused on literacy. Mm -hmm. So just know that that six it's credits coming. is not enough. Yeah. 
I mean, I've, I feel like I recently, and I could, again, I could be wrong. Melody and I were talking recently about the one of the former Michigan Teachers of the Year. Um, how do you include, how do you really practice inclusion in the classroom? And, and she was saying, I don't even think she had one course on effective essential practices for reading. So again, when you're trying to figure out inclusion, you can't even go there because you don't have the the skills. And it's not it's not at the it's not to discredit teachers at all. Um, again, I go back to what I do on a regular basis, and nurses and lactation consultants continue trying to work together to figure out what it is that we can get to the moms that want and choose to breastfeed. For those willing children that are going to learn to read, I really feel like we can get there as long as we really address all of the factors. Honestly, right. we're going to move on to Dr. Z, please. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm under understanding. I, I, for instance, uh, I assume the ten essentials for uh, um, pre-kindergarten are the ones that I'm looking at at pages eight, nine, and ten on the, uh, the big book. And then you use this to make sure that you're covering all the bases. And it seems to me that every theory of instruction assumes certain things you can take for granted. Um, and sometimes the, the old theory of teaching, you know, phonics and word recognition and context clues, this, this assumed a certain development in language already, and we're finding that some of our kids don't have that development, so now we got other, uh, I guess, goals or uh, essentials to uh, this is what they must have in order to go on to the next uh, in order to learn this next set of skills, I guess. So is, is that my basic understanding here? I think um, a lot of teachers have known all these pieces, but to be presented and be like, these are the 10 in a balanced program that you need to be targeting every day. Um, I know my teachers were doing the 10, but maybe not every day. Um, so yeah. just that awareness that you need to include this balanced meal um, to your kindergarten through third grade teachers every day. They need to have all the pieces, um, you know, every well, day. And it's certainly beneficial that we have a same, uh, I mean, there's many ways to slice and dice uh, uh, instruction, but it's nice to have a, a, a set uh, frame of reference, I guess, so we can communicate and, and uh, be on the same page. Uh, and then, uh, I'm not sure if this how closely related, but how did we get into practices like deer and, and the things that about which are asserted there is no uh, 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 proof that they benefit? I mean, how how do we how do we know we're not doing this again? Um, with the ten essentials? Not not specifically with the ten essentials, but just you know future practices. Uh, uh, I mean, if we've devoted so much of the school day to a practice that's not uh, effective, how do we, well, I suppose it's the, the old dilemma. Do you stick with the tried and true or do you embrace the innovative and then you find out that some of your innovatives are, innovations aren't as effective as they I appear to be? I have to do a what would Mel Duke say <laughs> moment. Okay. Because if she were at the yeah. table with us, um, one of her big points is if you compare a practice to not doing anything at all, Yes. It always looks like it's better. <laughs> true, true. So she would say be very deliberate in as you're trying a practice that, first of all, the practice is something that has been studied. We know that it actually impacts achievement, right? There is so much research on this now. We don't need to just be trying something out, learning in a really ad hoc way. The second thing is when you try something, compare it to actually doing something else, right? So it's not just does this practice work compared to nothing. Does this practice work, to, you know, against another really strong practice? Because what we want to do is we want to get to the very best practices. So being very deliberate and action research oriented even in, as we're doing our own work. Okay. Not sliding back into, well, it did better than nothing. All right, I right. want to thank you all for being here and for your presentation and your good work. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the committee, a whole agenda, is a presentation on Hope Network's Michigan Reading Corps, implementation and outcomes of the Reading Corps. Uh, the Michigan Education Corps has been a legislative grant to provide additional supports to young readers. 
They began their work on the west side of the state and are now expanding to other districts. They work primarily with students in grades K through three to strive to do that something extra that will help most challenge our young readers move forward. Both Lupe and Tyla have served on the Michigan Education Corps Advisory Board. The Executive Director, Holly Windrum, is here to present. Please. All right. Thank you very much for having me. I realize we're transitioning. Um, just as a note, um, you have a lot of information and hard copy, but there is a Google Drive folder that also has a lot, lot more um, information. So we can save a few trees in the process. But um, just by way of context, uh, for those of you that are new or maybe unfamiliar with Michigan Education Corps, we are an AmeriCorps program. There are three intervention programs that we support. We support preschool reading corps, K-3 reading corps, and this year we are piloting math corps, and I'll share a little bit more detail about that. Um, why are we doing this? Well, research. So research by the University of Chicago uh, conducted several years ago. Um, they conducted um, experimental research, a randomized control trial study on the K-3 model and a quasi-experimental design on the preschool model. And their research uh, showed two things. One was that this was a program that could be replicable and scalable. And number two, that the results could be attributed to the actual intervention itself, in particular for students that come to our doorstep with greater risk factors, such as dual language learners, economic disadvantage, et cetera. <clears throat> Those kids grow more. That's a good thing. So with that, uh, Minnesota decided to go statewide. So they now serve over 30,000 children every year with 1,600 tutors across all of the programs. They have a $12 million allocation in their education budget and their policy language as well as their budget language had bipartisan support. So this is a statewide effort. And these are NAEP data, you're well familiar with those, but I just wanted to show you that in general, Minnesota is seeing gains. Now, is it due to this precisely? No, it's, it's due to um, a cohesive set of things that they're doing um, across literacy and all academic work, but this makes a difference. Um, and I would say more specifically with the preschool reading core, just by nature of how that model works. So other states uh, became aware of this work, and so now it is being nationally replicated in 13 states. Georgia will be added next year. Michigan started in 2012-13, about midway through the year, in about four schools in the west side of the state. Now we are serving in 72 schools, several uh, preschool classrooms, and our goal is that we're going to reach about 2,700 kids. You can see we're statewide. Um, there's a lot going on in the Detroit area, um, and that I know that came up. Uh, just know that we're working closely with the new administration um, on a three-year rollout, so that way this becomes part of their overall literacy framework um, to try and address the needs um, in that, at that side of the state, but also in a lot of other districts as well. Um, the key takeaway on this slide is that we do meet the definition of evidence-based um, as noted in the third grade reading bill, and this is how. So I'm not going to read this to you. You're well familiar with that, but I, I want to make that emphasis because that's really important when we talk about what kind of intervention we're doing for our kids. The preschool model places a tutor or interventionist in a classroom all day, every day, and so largely we would say that's targeting tier one. It supplements, it does not supplant, but it does reach all children. In the K-3 model, tutors are working with a caseload of 15 to 20 students. It, is, it can be pull out or push in, but it is one-on-one. -on -one. So in an MTSS framework in which this work is all grounded, this is solidly tier two work. The model, data-based, evidence-based, and I'll draw your attention to implementation fidelity. So we pay rigorous attention to that and we measure it. We surround our tutors with two layers of instructional coaching, a site-based internal coach who commits a couple hours a week to support, and then we have an external master coach and their role is to ensure high fidelity to the program. In each model, uh, this is how it looks practically. Uh, in preschool, the, the tutors are interventionists, so they're all day, every day, and they're working on supplemental language, literacy, rich, very intentional interactions with kids. Um, they also will assess all learners seasonally, fall, winter, spring, and I'll show you some data. 
They will work at the direction of lead teachers um, with small groups or even individual kids when the time is appropriate. The center of the preschool work is around what's called a repeated read aloud. And you'll um, note that that is also discussed in the GELN essentials with which the program um, totally aligns. And that's some work that we've been able to do with that group to make sure that that's happened. Um, the goal is kindergarten readiness. In the K-3 model, one-on-one, -on -one, every day, 20 minutes. Research-based, targeted skill practice. It's not a curriculum. We are focused on working on what exactly is that sub-skill that that child needs to focus on. We will progress monitor weekly, and on average, our students reach grade level proficiency in about 14 weeks. So this is an example in both programs of where dosage matters when it comes to intervention. We have our ongoing coaching that's constant. We are doing regular direct observation fidelity checks throughout. It's not just a one and done. It's actually once every couple weeks. Uh, we have monthly data reviews. I'll show you an example. And there's a family engagement component, interestingly enough, named Read at Home. This is uh, where who we've served just this year, just to give you a sampling. Um, this is as of February 27th, and I just pulled the data yesterday for the uh, MESA meeting that we'll be at on Friday. Um, we are up to um, almost 2,000 kids. And just to note, in our K-3 model, um, here you see that we have 295 that have successfully met exit criteria. That's up to 330 now. So um, we expect to see that continue as more kids are in uh, the length of program that's needed for adequate dosage. But that gives you a sense of the data we collect and that our tutors collect and how we can really drill down to make sure that they are getting um, adequate service. So growth is a really important thing for us because in the monthly data reviews, we have to check and make sure that our kids who are receiving intervention are growing faster than their grade level peers. We've already determined that they are below grade level, so they can't grow at the same rate. They have to grow faster if they're going to close the achievement gap. <coughs> so the work that's been done on setting what we would call target scores for our kids include not only what should be expected for grade level, but what should be expected for kids that are below grade level and receiving reading core intervention. In 2016-17, you can see that on the measures that we used, that, this, that these percentages of kids, these are percentages that are kids who are meeting or exceeding the grade level growth targets. So for example, if a kindergartner is receiving reading core intervention last year and then currently 90% or 85% last year were meeting or exceeding the growth target for that grade level, which is kindergarten, and so on. Um, so we tend to see more growth fall to winter and a little slowdown winter to spring, which is kind of how our kids are. But um, the growth this year so far is through the end of February, so August to February, when you look at the, that growth. I'm particularly pleased with grade three, to be perfectly frank. So I talked about every child having a graph. This, um, for m some of you, may be very familiar. So we collect ongoing progress monitoring data. This is an example of a student's data. I have parent permission uh, to use this student um, as an example. This is Darian. And Darian is a student in Muskegon Heights. And he was um, reading below grade level. He's a second grader. And so he was a good candidate for the K-3 intervention. And so he entered service. And on this graph, the green dotted line is what we would call oral reading fluency. That's automaticity and expression. The red dotted line is accuracy. So we want to see that decrease, meaning his error rates decrease. The black thick line is his goal line, meaning where he started to where we want him to go. And that blue dotted line is a mathematically calculated slope. So visually, we can look at our growth in automaticity and get a sense of, is that steep enough or do we need to accelerate progress? You can see that the team met regularly and right around November decided that the growth was good, but he wasn't meeting or exceeding his growth target. So the database decision making happened right there in that red thick line and he accelerated. So he 
um, successfully met the exit criteria in about 16 weeks. Exit criteria is you have to have three to five progress monitoring data points at or above your goal line, and two of those must exceed the next seasonal benchmark target for your grade level. So it's fairly rigorous. And then we will track students. Uh, we'll progress monitor for a few weeks after. And then every student in Reading Corps will continue to be benchmarked through the end of third grade as long as they're, they're still with us and in a Reading Corps site. This is Martina, um, similar circumstance, but she um, was um, she was a dual language learner. She entered second grade reading very well below grade level. Um, but the story that this tells is that in <coughs> conjunction with Reading Corps intervention, she did close her achievement gap by the end of the year. Now, it took a whole year. This is about 32 weeks worth of data. Um, so it took longer. And I would suggest to you that um, there were other things happening to support this learner. But um, you can do that. Preschool data. So we have several measures of pre and early literacy that we use. And um, when we show our preschool teachers these data, we talk about growing the green and shrinking the red. So I'll just draw your attention to one example. These are statewide preschool data. But if you look over at the far left visually, you'll see there's a red, yellow, green. And this is fall data on a vocabulary measure. It's called picture naming. Students entering preschool for either they're four years old, might be five years old, but mostly fours. And we see that very few students were in the green, quote unquote, meeting the fall benchmark target for their age level. So we design intervention and we really focus on what is happening in the classroom to work with those students. And by the spring, which you see that line, we see that we've increased substantially the percent of students who are now meeting the spring target for their grade level. And maybe even more importantly, we've reduced the number of students who we would say are in the red and significantly discrepant. So those are the students that are gonna be going on to kindergarten. Very different picture group of kids that we're sending to the kindergarten teacher's doorstep than maybe would have entered in the fall. Yes? Can you give me a sense of what a benchmark for a four-year-old looks like? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> nope, that's a great question. So it is. Um, so we have to know um, in order to say whether or not our kids are growing, we have to know um, what are targets for kids. So like at age three, age four, on what measures. So um, just like we would have for like good health, um, we'd have a benchmark for like height and weight. For our kids similarly, we have to have some idea of is a kid on track to be ready to be successful. So what the researchers in Minnesota did is they started with the end in mind and they said really ultimately our goal is college career readiness. So they took the ACT college career readiness standards and they worked their way backwards to determine where does a child, where does a three-year-old, where does a four-year-old, where does a third grader need to be to be on track to meet the college and career readiness standards by the time they're a junior. And that's that's conducted uh, statistically. I still don't understand what a benchmark for a four-year-old looks like. Are we talking about can you pronounce words or are we talking about can you read the? I mean, what? Oh, absolutely. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. I wasn't quite tracking. So the measures, it's letter names, letter sounds. ABC. Okay. Yep. Yep. It's letter sounds. It's rhyming. It's being able to hear. It's being able to hear onset sounds and it's uh, vocabulary growth. Okay. Those would be the four areas that we would target. How often do you benchmark test? Three times a year, seasonally. Yep, they're, they're really quick measures. They take just a couple minutes. So they're indicators, they're screeners. So they're not deep not diagnostics. Yeah. What's it? They're not, they're not taking a written test. No, no, no. They're no. responding to teachers' yep. questions. Yep, yeah. Great questions, and thank you for um, allowing me to clarify that. Um, Muskegon Area Intermediate District, um, they have been great partners with us for uh, quite a while, and so they um, have looked at their data um, locally, and they have said for those students, and they uh, partner with us on the preschool reading core model, 
And so they've taken all of the kids that are in classrooms that have that third adult, that third intervention or that uh, interventionist, and then they've looked at all of their other preschool classrooms. And they've looked at their measures, so not data that we're collecting, data that they collect. And they've looked at things like letter recognition, letter sounds, as well as some math um, data as well. And they have targets, but in this is, um, they haven't run any statistical analysis on this, but for them, they look at this and they say, look, we know every child's growing, but when students have that reading core interventionist in the classroom, they show, they show more growth on numerous different kinds of measures. Um, and John can certainly speak more um, eloquently to that. Um, he and I are presenting on Friday with all of the intermediate superintendents. So um, this is, yes. Are these percentages? No, these are actual, so for example, there is a target, um, I believe it's anywhere from, it's about 20 uh, lowercase letter recognition for the measure that's being used here. And so these are actual numbers. So an average number of letters being recognized by students. So for example, if you're in a preschool reading court classroom, on average, you're recognizing 18. In another classroom, on average, it's about 16. So these are average scores for a class? Um, yes, a so it's actually level. several classrooms combined. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, um, one of the ways I talked about growth, and I talked about what we expect for grade level growth, as well as um, target growth for kids that are below. The yellow line here shows that we expect third graders to enter at reading, in this case, about 100 words read correct a minute on this particular measure, and end the school year at about 135. Okay, so that's what we expect for typical growth. That's about 1.6 words read correct per week. The blue line represents our reading core kids. So that's another way to look at the comparison. So our kids come in lower, that's expected, and they just nearly close the achievement gap. Why? Because they're growing faster. That has to happen. So their average growth is 1.73 words per week. That's really important. So that's another way to look at the growth. And in particular, these are my third graders. So um, that's, that's pretty doggone good. Um, our tutors, who are they? Um, they are largely individuals who are interested in going into education. And so we have had conversation with the Office of Professional Preparation as well as other higher education institutions to talk with them about development of a tutor to teacher pipeline. The experience that they get, the rigorous training, um, the coaching, it's not a student teaching but it definitely provides what I would call a clinical practicum kind of experience, and higher education uh, institutions are recognizing that, and so they are interested in how we can partner. In terms of systems, uh, annually we survey, and this shows that of our survey respondents, administrators, classroom teachers, as well as those site-based coaches who are school staff, do they see reading core as part of their overall literacy framework and to what degree? Okay, so this is really important because Naomi, um, she actually quoted Dr. Matt Burns in saying, you cannot intervene your way out of effective core instruction. That is very true. And so we want to make sure that they're not just doing an intervention, but that they're thoughtfully thinking about how is this working with all of this other great literacy work and all this other great literacy effort that we're putting forth in schools. Read at home, there's a lot here, and I'm just going to draw your attention to a couple things. Our tutors, secondarily, do send home uh, reading materials with our kids on a regular basis. Last is the data from last year. They sent home about 27,000 materials. Um, but what was impressive to me was the number of students that brought back a journal where there was a parent signature, particularly in our K-3 model, 83%. I thought that was, that was very impressive. So at least we have some emerging data that parents are engaging with kids over the reading material. Now, I can't, I can't prove that. I wasn't there to witness it. But that's, that's pretty telling, I believe. So that was, that was encouraging. And this just gives you an idea of over the last five years what data have looked like 
um, in what's leading us up till now. Quickly on MathCore, this is a pilot. Uh, we, are, we were invited to be the first pilot replication state. This targets uh, fourth through eighth graders to be algebra ready. We focus largely on number sense and operations and those kinds of things. Um, and um, we're seeing um, really nice growth so far. About 59% of our kids are on track to be proficient on their M-step in the spring. So more to come on that, but just wanted to give you a sense of where that pilot is going. If a school would love to partner with us, we would love to hear from them. There is a guide to apply, an application, and then a site agreement that follows. We do ask schools for a $5,000 participation fee. Um, we try to keep this very low cost, but also some skin in the game for our schools. And so when I talk with them, I kind of say, this is what you get for the time of your internal coach as well as this fee. We do meet all the requirements of the third grade reading bill in terms of intervention, save one uh, workshops for families. We don't provide those workshops. Um, we do provide school improvement language. We've worked closely with department staff on that. We do align with all the essentials. All of my master coaches attended all of the essentials training that happened last fall to make sure that we were working on speaking a common language. Um, and we provide all their data. So I'm very uh, pleased to say that we have, um, I, I feel a very uh, good positive partnership with our uh, Department of Education colleagues. There is a webinar that was led recently, February 5th, and um, largely um, spoke to the connection with the top 10 and 10 and um, some of these things that you see here and our, the Office of Professional Preparation. We've had um, a very good partnership with them as well. So with that, the rest of the slides are really um, just informational. And so I'm going to stop there. Um, I know I come You're my hero. You're getting us back on track. <laughs> All right. OK. <laughs> well, I was, I was given a very 20 minutes. So I, I timed it. Gold um, star. <laughs> all right. Well, well, with that, though, I, I did go fast. And did I, I did throw a lot of data at folks. So please, I, I welcome questions, really. Any questions? Tyler and then uh, Eileen. Um, Holly, thank you. Um, one one criticism I have, and I know as a board member that we shouldn't be micromanaging, but I can't figure out how to use the eraser. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do, a, we'll do a, what do you call that? You go we'll have to come up with YouTube. an intervention for that, we'll, right? We'll come up with a YouTube. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Talk about um, some of the overarching metrics for the program. I know we had a lot of discussions at some of the board meetings on, on how to change those um, and, and sort of why they were changed, what they are, kind of what, what you're thinking about changing them to. Um, in terms of really wanting to make sure that students who are growing, we have more, a greater number of students meeting and exceeding. Yep. So some of our challenges. Um, so we um, noticed that um, there were a couple of area of challenge, challenge where we weren't hitting the goals that we wanted. For example, average number of minutes per week in terms of dosage, um, ensuring that the number of students who successfully exited our intervention we're then also meeting their spring benchmark target for their grade level. We were seeing a larger percentage than I wanted to see of students who were slipping. So it's like, well, wait a minute. We just provided this great intervention. We kind of fixed the problem. But what's happening? Are we sending them back to an unhealthy environment? Um, why aren't we seeing sustained growth? And so that's one of the areas that we're looking very, very closely at. We're not the only state. Um, but it does, in some ways, have to do with, with the robustness of core instruction. Is it quality core instruction that they're headed back into? Um, but we also found that that internal coach piece has been really critical. And um, we find that schools, um, while they definitely um, do their best to ensure that that individual can be available, um, for the amount of time that we would ask in order to best support the program, that that can be a struggle as well. And when that person is not as available, um, we tend to find that fidelity gets a little bit more compromised to the model. And so those are conversations that we're having with schools now about um, trying to be a little bit more um, explicit, but then how what, what can we do to assist? Um, so we're trying to look at those those two items in order to um, hopefully get some of those percentages a little bit higher. Is that, does that get at what you were thinking or okay? All right, Eileen, please. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's 
delightful to hear this. It's yeah, terrific. Good. Um, I'm trying to, because you put both of these in one day and my mind is still trying to wrap around each of them, which is a little more complicated, but I look at uh, the, uh, the GELN effort as an, an, a professional learning um, uh, and classroom uh, change model. Yes. I look at this as external supports for uh, tutoring. So they're certainly compatible. I was curious, I just pulled up your... Uh oh, I lost it already. Anyway, I I was curious as to how much it is, how much of what you are doing co uh, uh, is um, aligned to what they're doing, um, and I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it. We're just getting both of these today, and also how broadly spread you are throughout the state, given the relatively small number of children who are being served, yes. and whether or not you've been able to move, um, whether this is a, a model that works particularly well for urban areas where you probably have the training and support for the tutors, um, but may be harder to use in uh, areas that are more rural unless there's a United Way or some, 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 some other service mechanism provided. So let me make sure I remember That's, all three of your yes, questions. Um, the, and of course, I've, I've now forgotten the first no, well, one. No, the first I one was the statement that you are an add-on tutorial program. Oh, yes, and, and how, okay. So what we did on le starting last summer and into this fall is we actually sat down and crosswalked our work with the essentials, all of the essentials, pre-K as well as K-3. And the goal was not that we were going to replicate what, what's happened, but the idea was is let's make sure that we're operating with the same research base. And, and, and then, and, and we were, and we are. In fact, there's a lot of research that supports what we do that is also supporting what's going on with the essentials. But then the second piece was, let's make sure that we're not sending coaches and doing training where maybe we're talking about the same thing, but we may be using different vocabulary. Let's make sure that we're speaking a common language so that way there's consistency and people don't feel confused. There's that alignment piece. And so to that end, we made sure that all of our external master coaches attended all of the essentials training. And then we have subsequently been keeping tabs with our master coaches to say, how is that going when schools are in their words, using the essentials and applying them in their core instruction in whatever capacity, how is that going? And so far it seems to be going well. So that's the answer to the first one. Um, you asked a question. Your reach. A reach, yep. So um, not unlike Minnesota, um, we are statewide and in fact we will be serving in the Upper Peninsula next year, starting next year. We've had outreach from Char M as well as Marisa two intermediate districts, um, which is geographically going to be a little bit of a challenge. So we're having to think about how we're going to support that. But um, our call is to work with any district that's willing to partner with us. And so we're going to make it work. We, we will make it work. Um, I would say that we do, you know, you would think that there would be more of a challenge finding people to serve in rural areas. But I honestly, um, it kind of blew that out of the water this year when we had a real mix of results in some areas that surprised me. Schoolcraft is an example. Um, we had no problem. Reese Puffer, no problem finding people. And yet I did not, um, I was not able to fill all of my tutor requests in the city of Detroit. So, you know, I'm, it's, it can be, it's interesting. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, I think, um, that are regional. So we have, one of the things that we're working on, though, is that tutor to teacher pipeline and trying to find individuals who this is already their passion and let's give them a really authentic, rich experience. Um, so that's why higher education has also been interested in partnering. Um, the research that I talked about by the University of Chicago, there were no differences across geographic regions served, across any demographic group when it came to the effectiveness. And so in our mind's eye, any child that's struggling with reading is a child that can benefit from the intervention. We have seen our results have been very similar. So every year, annually, we get together and we look across Minnesota, looks across all the states, because you expect to see similar results, right? If it's good for any kid, then it should work in any state, any geographic. And that's generally what we're seeing nationally is the results have been pretty consistent. 
Um, so that's a sign to me that when the research said it's replicable and scalable, it was correct. Um, because we see similar results nationally to what we see in Michigan, to what we see in Minnesota. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, thank you for being here. My for pleasure. Reason. Oh, uh, Nikki, please. Question. Yeah. Um, I sort of nervously giggled there for a minute when we were talking about assessments. I know that you said it's just three times throughout the year, yeah. and it's pretty simple. As they get older, is it less simple? Is it more paper and pencil or computerized? No, in our K-3 model, it continues to be, um, it's actually a three-minute um, seasonally and then one minute once a week, and it's a child reading. And do you get this, I mean, do, I mean, no, we don't have data on this. That would be an interesting <coughs> point of research. Do you get the sense that students know they're being assessed? Is it, is it, or, or do they, are they okay with being, like, that, is that an impact That's for a valid question. Actual achievement? Does, yeah. that, does that impact their achievement? No, okay. No, um, there is, interestingly enough, there has been research done on that. Okay. Specifically with these measures. <laughs> so that's really interesting that you said that. Um, no, generally we don't. And yes, the kids do know. The kids know. And they're fine. The kids we find are generally more fine than we give them credit for mm -hmm. um, with the assessments. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you that there's not the, I, I've had the occasional kid that's really anxious, and I, I get that. And I'm certain that that happens yeah. from time to time. And so that's where we need to. Um, Do you feel like it gives them a sense of direction then it instead? Does. Of it does. It does. Well, so the kids get to see their own graphs, which can be extremely motivating for them because they'll go, oh, and we talk about setting personal best goals with them. So it's not about, you don't have to go from here to here, but it's just, let's try to beat your personal best. And these are all kids, kids with disabilities, kids. Great question. So these are kids that locally are to have been identified as reading just below grade level. Oh, just below. So I would suggest to you that it's often not students who, if they've already been identified as having a disability, if it's a learning disability, they should be receiving more intensive service for whatever their learning disability is. We may from time to time have a student that may be receiving special education service under another category, maybe social behavior or that sort of thing, but then still just needs that little academic boost. That would be an example where it would be appropriate. We don't have very many students. Um, no. Yeah. yeah. All of those students. Okay. Thank you, Nikki. All right. Thank okay. you very Thank much you. for being here in your presentation. Next item on the committee, the whole agenda. Uh, uh, well, we should clap. <laughs> Next item on the committee, the whole agenda is presentation and partnership district model. The item covers updates uh, related to the Office of Partnership Districts, along with districts highlighting examples of progress. We'll continue to provide monthly updates on the partnership models, things that are working and that aren't working. Today we have Dr. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent for Educators, Student and School Supports, and Dr. Dedrick Martin, School Reform Officer and Director of the Partnership District. Now she's caught, caught us up a little, but we got till 1145. Got you covered. <laughs> Good morning and thank you. Um, just wanted to give a, a brief update on uh, partnership districts, where we are, and we have a lot of things uh, getting ready to move forward. So. Um, basically, without recapping everything, um, we're identifying the schools uh, that are most need of additional supports um, and uh, developing partnerships with them as well as community partners to generate a plan for success moving forward. Um, about this time last year, um, March 20, uh, 2017, uh, there were 10 districts and 38 schools that were identified as low achievement. Uh, and we uh, entered into this innovative partnership agreement to help them um, achieve uh, a measure of success or a higher measure of success uh, within 36 months. Um, when the second round came around, uh, it brought us up to about 16 districts with uh, 72 schools that are, uh, were deemed as low achieving. Um, and so this partnership um, has expanded uh, so to speak, and we are in the process of getting ready to expand again. So, um, as you can see from this slide, here are the uh, 16 districts, and the majority of those districts we have already, um, we have a partnership agreement with them uh, signed and in place, 
and we have also gone out to do a nine-month review. Uh, there are a few nine-month reviews that are uh, uh, still uh, slated to be done uh, between uh, the second round group, but uh, we are um, on pace to uh, move forward and support those districts. Currently, uh, over the last couple of weeks, we have been very busy with uh, making personal calls, uh, myself as, as well as uh, State Superintendent Wiston. Uh, we reached out to um, approximately 20 new districts that will be onboarded. Um, this process will really begin uh, from April 1st to June 30th. Uh, but we have uh, reached out to those districts individually as well as the ISDs that are located in, and, and in addition to that, um, any of the um, authorizers uh, that uh, those districts belong to, to kind of talk them through um, um, the next round of partnership districts, what to expect from us in terms of supports, uh, we are in the process of assigning them a liaison, even though the information will not go public until uh, March 30th, uh, they have been made aware uh, and they're reviewing the information on the secured website. Um, and we are already uh, beginning to work with them, but the real work starts uh, April 1 through June 30th. So we're kind of beginning the process to onboard uh, those districts. And that will bring, uh, again, approximately 20 new districts and up to 40 new schools. So uh, we will have a significant number of schools we'll be supporting uh, heading into next school year. Um, here's one example of success uh, from a recently completed uh, nine month um, update. And so I'll kind of speak to it and, and Vanessa may jump in, but um, they were able to involve over 170 community members in their uh, partnership agreement, which is pretty uh, impressive. Um, in addition to that, uh, they were able to show uh, evidence of infrastructure improvement uh, in the areas of ta talent management, also in the area of uh, individual student supports um, and curriculum. Um, that was one of the areas that uh, they had noted as uh, needing to um, uh, move forward uh, to meet their 18-month goals, and they have uh, already begun the process to implement and align uh, research-based curriculum, uh, K-12 and math and ELA. They are also on target with blueprint installation, uh, and uh, according to their letter, uh, they're on target with strong fidelity, uh, which is a good sign. And they have been very, um, they have been very uh, keen into trying to get uh, exposure above and beyond the classroom. So, uh, one of the things that was noted is that a lot of their kids. Uh, just uh, didn't have the opportunity to explore things that uh, in general is part of their greater community. So whether that is going to uh, visit Lake Michigan, which is maybe only three miles from where they are, or the local um, uh, museums, or um, um, seeing uh, theater productions, or farmer's market, or just several things. So really trying to look at uh, not only providing uh, uh, more infrastructure to build more systemic improvement, but looking at uh, the well-rounded needs of a child and exposing them to more than just uh, reading, writing, and math. So that's one example. Another one that I, I didn't put in there, um, uh, Pontiac, we uh, just recently, about a week and a half ago, uh, met with them uh, for their nine-month agreement. Um, they are, uh, according to their NWE data, already started to show uh, some nice uh, signs of improvement and success moving in the right direction. Um, they also, I believe, are um, uh, working diligently with their blueprint installation um, and other issues of infrastructure to build uh, the systems for more systemic uh, ongoing improvement. I don't know if you had more to add. Uh, you know, returning to Muskegon Heights, I, I think I spoke about them last month because I'd just come off their nine-month visit and how exciting it was to see what's going on. And Muskegon Heights is certainly a community that's been through a lot in the last 5, 10, 15 years. Um, 
one thing just to highlight in addition to what Diedrich highlighted, uh, John Severson, who was just here from MA, or Muskegon MA area, <laughs> there's so many MA <laughs> ISDs, um, they are, they're, they're one of several great examples of ISD district partnerships. So we were talking afterward, and, he, and I, we saw this at the meeting too, um, the ISD is just integrally involved with the district. Mm -hmm. The district can call, they can ask for support. The ISDs are, like the, dis, the department, I think, trying to be creative, innovative, uh, respond to needs, you know, as opposed to kind of here's our standard delivery set, Be go the opposite way and say, what is it that you need and how can we come alongside and partner? And if we don't exactly have it, then we can get it, we can find it, let's problem solve. So they are a really good example of, of partnerships throughout the community with the ISD, with the department. Um, and I, I think I said this before, but I just want to say again, Renee Garcia is their superintendent, and she is a very inspirational leader. If you have a chance to speak with her or see her, you know, the vision that she has and the way she brings her staff along and the engagement of the staff and students is very exciting in Muskegon Heights. So I said when I was there for nine months, I, I said, I, I believe you're going to meet your goals, and what a story of success that will be when Muskegon Heights can do it, because we haven't seen that kind of outcome from that district in a long time. Um, uh, another one that I uh, uh, had a Elena, chance. Please. Sorry, uh, do you want to do you want to finish? Uh, sure. Or, or, and I'll ask after. I wasn't sure the presentation was done. So. Okay, almost. Okay. <laughs> um, another example uh, where they're doing some good work: uh, East Point uh, School District. Uh, they also had a showing of strong fidelity with their blueprint uh, installation. Uh, they are really focusing on the talent management aspect uh, within their district and uh, as such uh, they're developing almost like a teacher residency program with uh, one of the local universities. Uh, so there's multiple examples and so at an upcoming date uh, what we plan to do is bring um, uh, two or three districts here and allow them to present uh, firsthand some of the success that we're starting to see already with our partnership agreement. Um, but knowing that uh, we are really working on um, uh, helping districts acquire their 21, uh, the 21 H, 21H grant funding uh, to support some of their initiatives and also we're very busy uh, with the process of onboarding approximately 20 new districts. Um, that's kind of taken the work of the department. So the next uh, presentation will be kind of uh, speaking to those new districts and how we got to that point and what we see moving forward and then upcoming meetings bringing some of those partnership districts in to speak about their success. The East Point and the Pontiac example um, are good places for me to highlight something else that's emerging here. Uh, <coughs> Michigan is, is, a, is uniquely positioned and a leader in this space and the space is uh, around staffing, recruitment, educators, and partnership districts. So you guys, I think two presentations ago, or maybe three, we talked about staffing and how that was an issue that every single partnership district had. And some of what our Office of Educator Workforce was trying to propose, what they were proposing, uh, Dr. Martin referenced, East Point went to one of our technical assistants where we brought I higher ed institutions, the department and the districts. They said, we want a teacher residency. Uh, Superintendent Whiston has been promoting, and it's in the Marshall Plan too, this grow your own cadet teaching sorts of opportunities, um, DPSCD is looking at that. So what we have is the educator pipeline, a set of districts who have desperate needs in the educator pipeline, and a willingness and a need to innovate, and moving forward with innovation. So we don't really know exactly what works best for recruitment <coughs> in terms of the profession, particularly in, harder, in the hardest to staff districts, but we have some ideas and we're trying them. And the other thing that makes this unique and special is we have research partnership with this. So with Michigan State University, with uh, Catherine Strunk and Josh Cohen as part of the education policy, um, oh, they're going to kill me. I, I, know, I always forget what the I stands for. Mm -hmm. Improvement Collaborative, Innovation Collaborative, it's innovation, um, too many eyes. Edu education Policy Innovation Collaborative, um, they are literally working right with us on evaluation and research around all the partnership districts, but as we try innovations, build it out so we can tell whether it worked or not. So Michigan is uniquely positioned with the vision around educator workforce, district that needs it, and a research partner, so we can innovate and evaluate at the same time. I just think that's a really rare occurrence to get those three things lined up. Usually research is evaluating after it's happened, so it's kind of a you know post-mortem, it didn't work or it did, but you're five years down the path, so how does that help? 
or you have you don't have a clear sense of how you want to innovate or districts aren't ready like we have a really interesting and profitable for our whole enterprise not financially profitable but uh, advance ad an opportunity to advance the body of knowledge as well as support our districts so that's a, a very exciting thing and I think we want to take that model or we're trying to take that model of districts solutions possible problems innovation and implementation into other areas uh, around the department so for example though supporting the whole child what really works in supporting the whole child how do we get actionable with schools around climate culture suspension we have ideas we have things we try but we've got a group of districts who are saying no we really if you um, like I'll go back to Renee Garcia she said to me I've tried this this and this around getting a, my attendance numbers up what else, what am I missing is there something I'm missing I'll try other things so we've got a group of districts wanting to innovate wanting to use best practice so how do we align, and this has been Brian's vision from the beginning for all districts, is getting best practices together, putting the SEA, us, in the space of a partner, a best practice, a technical assistance provider, and then help the districts implement and evaluate how it's working. So this is big picture, not district specific, but something that partnership districts, what's going to help us be successful in partnership districts, but also help us advance as a state overall. I do want to say that uh, while it's going well in most districts, we are having some challenges. And one of those biggest challenge districts is Benton Harbor, where things are not progressing uh, as we would like to see. And so Diedrich and uh, Kyle and others are in conversations with the uh, Treasury Department because they're also under a consent agreement besides a partnership model. And we're working with them to try to, uh, to uh, move the district forward. but. Bottom line, if we don't see some jump in growth and jump in activities, you know, they may be positioned uh, in the near future for next round of accountability. And so uh, we hope we don't have to go there, uh, you know, but we, we, we'll just wait and see how this all works out. And we're trying to avoid it, trying to work with the district, but uh, progress is not where we'd want to see it to be there. So we'll keep you posted on that. Questions, Eileen? Thank you, and welcome to MDE. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I keep on wondering who's going to do all this work, and then we get you. So um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, obviously, the, the first two presentations we had this morning are spot on for the kinds of needs that many of these districts would have. And uh, my first question, I've got three or four. One would be, is there a way that you connect people to districts as you start this process? Not You can't midwife it, but you can provide the resource and yes. urge them to evaluate it. Um, a second, I wanted to know who is doing the research. Is it different in each area? Um, the, and the third thing is uh, something that's come up in the last few months in discussions uh, with uh, business leaders from Michigan. And they talk about how businesses very often approach uh, schools uh, to provide support. That may be money, it may be people, but it very often is the business sort of driving the conversation as opposed to the school analyzing where their actual needs are and then being able to perhaps change the thrust of that funding or those volunteers. And I wondered if that's the sort of, whether you've been seeing that, whether that's an issue. It, it, it may be a, a bigger issue in southeastern Michigan for a coordination than it is in Detroit where Talent 20, or in Grand Rapids, uh, where Talent 2025 has actually really been working on that kind of uh, resource uh, uh, support. So, um in terms of connecting the districts uh, to other players, uh, that really will fall into the role of our uh, district liaison. So uh, as we talked about, we uh, all of our liaisons are supporting a number of districts now. Um, and over the next couple of weeks, uh, we will be kind of shifting and identifying which other districts they'll support so that they can help with them uh, connect whether it's with MDE or with various community partners and think through how to build that out. Uh, and let, let me just, say something. I'm, I'm actually talking about essentials. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, because that, that looks to me as if um, it has the strongest support for uh, logical instruction in okay. literacy. Okay. And that very often is one of the biggest problems that you encounter in these schools. So this goes back to um, our vision for that service delivery plan, where we have uh, things like the uh, essential elements of literacy that have been developed between MDE partners, we have, and the way of work process that we have, we know what the it is. We know what essential elements mm -hmm. for literacy are for early childhood or early 
early elementary, all the grades actually. The liaisons, the partnership office, none, they don't have to recreate that. They don't have to go find it. We right. have it. So we're really building it out where the liaisons know we have this these packaged up things and we say, hey, partnership districts, here's the essential elements for literacy and the pieces. Here, partnership districts, here's staffing solutions. Here's solutions around climate, culture, attendance, behavior. Um, making sure we're coordinated and like like Diedrich said, both internally and externally, and the literacy elements are a great example of GELN, the ISDs, all those partners together, the research partners delivering so that we're not, um, in the past sometimes we have started over office by office, district by district, we're trying to stop starting over once we know what it is, what the it is, <laughs> then let's use it. Um, so that's, that's ingrained into the structure of the office and the delivery to partnership districts. And then the other uh, question you asked in terms of uh, the business driving the conversation, uh, we hope through uh, each district as they go through the onboarding process, they need to go through a comprehensive needs assessment and analysis to figure out what they need. Um, and so in that part, we, we will either uh, partner someone with them or try to support them in analyzing what they need. But we hope that that becomes the driver of how the businesses may support uh, the agreement or not. Because a lot of times in districts that struggle, there are a number of people who want to do good things and they want to help. Uh, but if it's not organized or if it's not focused, um, we really don't see the impact. And so we're hoping to get at that question uh, through uh, doing a deep dive with the comprehensive needs analysis and then talking about when you bring in these community partners or resources, then it needs to be specifically tied to the things that you list in your agreement um, that you need to show specific improvement in. Uh, so in some ways, we hope that that kind of manage this process or give the district's language to uh, better direct these these uh, business and community partners instead of letting them drive the conversation. River Rouge is a good example of a district that went through a needs analysis. They had a lot of partners. They've asked some to maybe not be partners <coughs> or to partner in different ways. They've had those critical conversations. Um, and then on your research question, I know there's other questions, I'll just be short. Uh, so this is a much bigger conversation I'd love to share with the board sometime about our approach to strategic research across the department. We're working toward a strategic research agenda keyed to all areas of the 10 and 10 with a plethora of research partners, all centralized through this MARI is the overarching initiative, Michigan Education Research Initiative. It's a partnership between U of M and MSU, and it's designed to build out the strategic research capacity of the MDE without us doing all of it. And, you know, we have amazing researchers in the state and they are at our leading research universities, mm -hmm. appropriately so. So uh, we're following models. Uh, North Carolina has done it this way. Um, Massachusetts and Tennessee have somewhat similar models. As part of that, one of our major initiatives that we know we need a research partner for is partnership districts. The two MSU researchers I named, Josh, Josh Cowan and Catherine Strunk, are our partnership district research partners. But they're also helping us, helping facilitate this big agenda where we'll have, when it's all up and running, lots of partners working on lots of things. But um, that Mary helping coordinate, getting them the data, onboarding them, uh, connecting them with program staff. So it working as an extension of the state so we can really, um, and I know I always, I, I love to put a plug in for this, Michigan is Absolutely. We are one of the states, when I'm out nationally, they say, tell us about your research partnership. The way we partner with researchers is actually very unique, very groundbreaking. We're a leader on it. I don't think we know that back home, the whole kind of profit in their own town, not welcome sort of idea. But we are actually um, really on the cutting edge of this. So, And we're at the verge. We've been doing a lot of these partnerships for a number of years, we're on kind of the 2.0 version. I'm very excited about it. So that's my two-minute plug. We got to stay on time, but <laughs> that's to answer your question. And Shall I want I? to add that at Education Commission for the States, if they'll ask me that I went to, I had two different people from other states come up to me and talk about this. So I was really surprised because I didn't understand. I mean, I felt a little deer in the headlights, yeah, <laughs> but it's fabulous. So thank I'm you. really excited. Yeah, I have Pam. And then Nikki, please. So 
I, again, I always have to commend you all for the work that you all are doing in this groundbreaking work because I know that things are, uh, this is new, but then also the districts that you're working with, things are quite fluid there, um, you know, as they make adjustments to try to improve the quality of education. I guess um, getting at Eileen's point, and then Dietrich, you, you brought up some of these things. Um, being um, in a community and kind of like being a convener at one time, it's very difficult for schools to get to different tables where they're talking about this new way of making sure that we're leveraging and we're partnering. So that's a big piece that's missing and we've talked, I've talked about this quite a bit and you know just making sure that we're um, helping districts to see the importance of being in community so that they're a part of these conversations whether it's the business community, whether it's uh, the health and human services tables, and I, I, I understand the struggles because it's not like they can send teachers out of classrooms to go to these tables and then the superintendents are usually pretty stretched but it's very important for them to be at these tables so that they can then co create the capacity to be able to, to move about a little bit better. So I think that that's just a really big piece is helping these districts to understand the importance of being at, at these various tables whether it's the business community or um, because they're, they're being discussed, the districts are being discussed. Um, so they need to be at these tables so that they're not, um, you know, th there are not things that are being driven by the business community or any of these other partners, but that they're able to, to offer what's really needed. Um, so that's just, I think, a really big place where there, there's a need, where, where districts and superintendents need to understand why it's important. Um, as it relates to, uh, you know, the, the boards, because that's a big piece, um, um, the boards of education, and I know we had um, MASB that, that came and talked about their new guidance document. Are we weaving some of the, these things together? Because obviously, um, whether it's that folks are looking uh, to bring on new superintendents, but they really need some help in, in um or I think that they could use guidance and making sure that they understand these, what the partnership model is, what the purpose of it is, as well as how do they look for a leadership that has this innovative way of thinking as well as know how to uh, drive these partnerships. You talked about educators. One of the big issues that these schools are having is even having substitute teachers. Um, so some mm -hmm. of these things are like, buildings on fire type of yes. of thing. So um, making, I'm sure that you guys are on it. I just wanted to bring that up. Um, one of the big pieces that I hear in these communities is teacher voice and community voice. So not speaking to administrators is one thing, but when we go in and we're doing these site visits, are we really hearing from the teachers and are we really hearing authentic uh, community voice and are we having this reciprocating uh, discussion back and forth? Um, and then the nine-month reviews, um, I know we talked about this when we were last meeting, and I don't know if we decided whether or not that, if any of that information that came out of that would be publicized, shared, but I think that that's a good way to have that back and forth dialogue with community to let them know, you know, where, where we are with these partnerships that have been designed. Um, so that was just a question. So I think that's it for me. That was a... That was like a Dan Barner set of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I kind of replaced Dan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so with the nine-month review, uh, what I've instructed the liaisons to do is we want to look at uh, things that we see as promising or moving in the right direction, um, and then things that they might want to focus on um, as they prepare for the 18-month mark. Uh, so our goal, this is kind of an informal review our goal is not to be overly critical, but, but find ways to kind of celebrate uh, what they're doing um, and then give a nod to, but you might want to think about the following because you know, you're nine months away from um, a major milestone and you're not quite on the right path. Um, as far as how they communicate that in a broader level, uh, we really hadn't contemplated that yet, but it's certainly something that um, they would be more than willing, uh, or they're more than uh, all right to share with um, 
-hmm. Hopefully, their their community partners that are at the table, as well as uh, others who may be interested. So we can probably uh, work on that or flesh that out a little bit more. But that is the intent to kind of give them some informal feedback uh, so that we have no surprises at 18 months about this feels good. Mm -hmm. This is not quite uh, what we are thinking or envisioning, or you might want to spend some time working on that before you get to the 18-month mark or the 36-month mark. And backing up to boards and then the survey real quick. Um, so when Superintendent Whiston did the first round, we did the first round of onboarding. MASB was at the table for almost all the meetings, I think. And some of the second round, I think as we go into the third round, the problem has been a little bit of scale. You know, uh, Diedrich and Superintendent Whiston and I have <coughs> 22 initial meetings and then 22 follow-up meetings to make. So it gets harder the more we have. Um, but MASB was very involved, and the partnership agreements require board actions, and many of the partnership agreements have, you know, we will review the guide. So we push them toward the MASB guidelines, board policies. Diedrich has a, a really strong vision around supporting superintendents and their interaction with boards and how we build out our capacity to help there, because that's the other half of the board-superintendent relationship is how does that go two ways. Yep. Survey-wise, um, surveying teachers, so that's the board, has, this board has asked, several times about getting that information from teachers, um, from principals. So we are planning with our research partners in the fall to do a survey of all the principals and teachers that's independent, both for evaluative purposes as well as some of, I think, what you've been asking about what they might tell their superintendent might not be what they tell in a secure survey setting. It is not expanded to community members right now because of cost and size, but I think that's a, I made a note to look at the research design and see how we can do focus groups or maybe some more surveying or something if we can find some more. And I, I think <coughs> sharing that nine months might, if, if, if they're sharing that, that might be a way of community to give input. That's a great point. Thank you. All right, Nikki, please. I'll make my question short. Um, and I haven't asked this yet. I don't think we've talked about it. Is there a student-led portion of the partnership model mm -hmm. so that we can kind of see? I feel like if you know, in some of these partnership districts that are experiencing success, you know, we watch all these wonderful videos on competency-based learning, and those were exciting to see. Other kids seeing that is probably, probably excites them to be a part of something different or new. Um, I, I have to believe that that type of, like, making some videos or, I don't know, getting to them examples of other success where they see themselves in those shoes moving forward, right? Yeah. So I don't know if there's a student-led portion that we can incorporate. So that their There's their voice now. is at the table. I mean, too. we haven't. That hasn't been a I, good I, idea, though. I love mm -hmm. it. It's a great idea, and I think actually our um, some of the work in the ten and ten around learner centered supports and student voice is a great chance to align those ten and ten. Same thing, like I'm saying, ten and ten has big ideas for everyone. Partnership districts give us a place to really dig in and say, here's some best ways to get student voice. Here's some best practices, mm -hmm. and let partnership districts try it first or give input first, um, not in a guinea pig sort of way, but in a you get the best that we have to offer so we can get it to mm -hmm. our highest needs district. So that's a great idea, Nikki. We'll see how we can fold that in. It's a good yeah. idea. Yeah, that's a real good idea. Yes, please. Michelle? Um, so the question I have is, so I, I like the idea of the pipeline um, and trying to get teachers in. I know a number of teachers in East Point, and they left because they got a 25% pay cut. Um, and I, I'm just wondering, so if you get them in, is there a strategy or an approach to keeping them to how do you retain them and, and the, any recommendations or, you know, how, you know, how do you get your hands around, around that? So, so just one of just, uh, do we have it full fledged out as a strategy right now? No. Um, one of our districts that's working on uh, the talent management piece is asking that, that very same question. And so uh, one of the requests that they asked for us through uh, 21H funds is how could we, uh, they're trying to develop a program to uh, deal with the uh, large pay scale gaps that they have. But um, part of that, that conversation was we may be able to help you, and, and we have to do some things uh, in order to, to get in place to help them, but, but what is the larger thought, and how would you structure this out? So <coughs> we don't have an answer, but we're kind of uh, watching some of these places as they deal with talent management uh, and trying to address this problem. Uh, we're trying to look at what 
best practice are and what's realistic that we can do. So we're having that conversation, but I don't, I don't know of any examples where it's detailed. Yeah. They're certainly working. I mean, you're absolutely right. They all, and we've said this at this table, they all share, they're significantly lower than their county averages. They've, many of them have frozen, so they haven't gotten the raises. This is a real thing. So I we see it as twofold. One is like Diedrich is talking about these within the 21H, within what you can do, what are incentive programs, uh, bonuses, management, climate and culture, engagement, you know, um, River Rouge again working on like their staff calming room kind of where they have a place to go that's soothing. So to make it easier, better, more supported to work there, but that does, we have to as a state talk about what are we going to do about these inequities in, in pay? And there's, we have some ideas, but I think we, we do need to understand that in our, in our most, in the districts where we most need the best talent, they are the districts that are least financially equipped to, to yeah. compensate them, even at the level of, of districts. Forget like extra compensation. You know, there's a lot of debate about should you have, I know we were talking at the Governor's Ed and Talent Summit yesterday about um, differences in pay for shortage areas or things. I mean, there's a lot of ideas in that space, but I think there's a state level conversation as well as the districts are trying very hard to be creative and get and retain staff, but there's a bigger Right. issue yeah. we need to try and to I would suggest it. Oh, and, and, and just so you know, uh, just to further this, uh, we've already reached out to uh, other departments, our, our HR department, if you will, and, and uh, professional uh, uh, staff to look at a networking meeting to address issues of staffing. How do you uh, recruit, uh, attract, and retain uh, employees? So. Uh, we actually have a meeting <coughs> scheduled coming up to work with our partnership districts on looking at these issues and here are some best practices that other places have utilized. Okay. And I would suggest in that survey of teachers to ask the teachers, you know, what could be done to uh, make the environment a better place to stay. Absolutely. Yeah. Or even exit interviews, why find people, why they left. Yeah. Because it might not always be pay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's where the districts are trying to focus on the, when it's not pay, what can they do? They really are. So that's the climate, culture, engagement, voice, all of those things. Unfortunately, it's pay a lot of the time. Yeah. But yeah. yeah they have, yep. all right. Thank you very much families. for being here. Thank you. Right. Presentation. Next item on the committee of whole agenda is discussion regarding yeah. criteria for grant programs. Oh, we have a plan. Even though they're internal staff and problem. So the two grant criteria are for kindergarten entry observation and criteria for section 104E assessment of digital literacy pilot project. <gasps> is there any questions on those grant programs? Cassandra, please. What is the Maryland, Ohio pilot? It's, it's the, the first one, the, um, the million dollars to the ISD for the kindergarten uh, going to Johns Hopkins University to to pilot the Maryland Ohio pilot of a kindergarten ready assessment. Does anyone know exactly what this is? Uh, oh. You, Vanessa? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say Scott might be able to answer it. I don't know. So, um, so the, the, the MKEO pilot project is, it's a project funded and required by the legislature. It's run by Washtenaw ISD with assistance from MASA, MAISA. So Maryland and Ohio have piloted this kindergarten entry observation tool developed by a consortium of, it's, they're part of this consortium that's developed this tool. There's strong interest in Washtenaw, MASA, MAISA in this, that space that, um, the entry observation space, are kids ready for kindergarten? How do we know? We've had a lot of conversations at this table about the difficulties of getting to good tools in that space, but this is a consortium that's been piloting in multiple states this tool. So the legislature funded a pilot program for it. Um, so it's run by the ISDs and the locals. It's not MDE's tool, although we're supporting the grant implementation and looking forward to the results from the pilot because I think knowing, we, knowing what works in this space is important when we think about um, so forward. has this so the legislature mandated that this go through Johns Hopkins? I'm assuming it's their pilot. I mean, it's their program. Yeah. Yes. Doctor Z, how many students are actually involved or affected? 
Re just it's ballpark. it's about three ISDs that are in this consortia, but I don't have a good number off the top of my head, so I'd have to. Again, it's we are the fiscal to get the money out, and we're supporting implementation, but it's not directly our program, and so I don't have as many. I'm sure, I'm sure they'd love to come. Scott Menzel would love to come tell you all about it. He's very excited about this work. So, okay. um, but I I can get information, but I don't have it. It's in. It's actually in the support materials. Uh, the, oh, thank the you. Maximum number of students, and if there's if there is a problem reaching that, then it's a percentage of students. Um, but it's in the it's in the little tiny print. At least oh, three thousand kindergarten pupils. Right. All right. Any other questions? Are great, Craig dear. None. As we were moving to the regular meeting, calling the uh, regular meeting to order. The time is now. Uh, 11.45 and a quorum of the board is present. The Board of Education regular meeting of March 14, 2018 is called to order. We're going to vote to convene closed session to discuss annual evaluation of the state superintendent. Before we break for lunch, as you know, my evaluation is on the agenda for later in the meeting. And according to Section 8A of the Open Meetings Act, a public officer can request a closed session in order to consider a periodic personnel Evaluation. Therefore, I'll entertain a motion followed by a roll call vote to go into such session. So move. Support. Roll call, Marilyn. Fecto. Yes. McMillan absent. Pew. Yes. Ramos Spontini. Yes. Snyder. Yes. Albridge. Yes. Weiser. Yes. Ziley. Yes. <laughs> motion passes, and we will be. Uh, at ease until 1.15 when we'll come back from uh, the lunch and executive session. My 10-year-old just put out a class again. Yeah. 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 Ye